I want to introduce another topic, and it, it, it's somewhat of a free-floating topic, but it fits nicely into this other market structure, um, and that is uh, price discrimination, right? So price discrimination um, is when different customers um, are paying different prices for different goods, and that could be um, to come in two main forms. It's when it could be when you have Two customers who are buying their first unit are paying different prices. Um, that's price discrimination based on customer type or groups of customers. And the other one is a quantity price discriminating discount. So you buy the first unit for a certain price and you buy a second unit for a different price. Um, both of those are different forms of price discrimination. We can real quick lay out the, the three different degrees of price discrimination. We have first degree, second degree, and third degree price discrimination starting at the bottom and working our way up. Third degree price discrimination is based on customer type. And so again, right, not again, but for the first time, this is probably not something that you're unfamiliar with, right? So you go to the movies, oftentimes many movie theaters are going to offer a military discount, to, right? And so that's certain customers are paying a different price than someone who's non-military. Or when you see um, discounts for senior citizens or for kids, all those kinds of things, right? Whenever um, um, there's a group that's getting some kind of discount, that's uh, price discrimination. So we can think about an adverti advertised menu price discrimination where you, you walk into a store and you see different prices for different groups, but that's not the only way that price discrimination, third degree price discrimination based on customer type might also happen. You can also think about, right, if you start searching online for buying different items, um, is everyone going to see the same advertised price and the same advertised discounts, right? So hopefully you're, you're aware that that doesn't happen, right? That based on your, your browsing history, they make a, um, an assessment of uh, which customer type you are, and then they may offer you different um, discounts that are specifically tailored to that, right? And the other classic example that, that gets talked about is the, the actual browser that you're using um, when you're looking at things, um, right? So people who use... Um, those Apple-based browsers, that there's some evidence to suggest that there's some price discrimination based on that, right? And again, it's getting at this, this customer type. So sometimes it's very explicit. You see it on a pricing menu, the difference in customer type, and sometimes it's a little bit more in the background. But either way, if you've got different customers paying different prices, that's third-degree price discrimination. Again, second-degree price discrimination is when it's based on quantity, right? And so this is the buy one, get one, uh, half a, I don't remember that the the BOGO of sales I don't remember what that actually stands for um, but the right you, you buy a first unit and then additional units cost a different amount in this class we can also think about if you were to buy just like a little 20 ounce um, of pop versus if you were to buy a six pack I do six of these right and so you can buy them in a bundled pack so we can talk, it's more appropriate for a marketing class to talk about bundled pricing, um, but from an economic perspective, we can also mention that um, when, you're, when you're thinking about this kind of decision, right, the first, uh, if you're just going to buy one 20-ounce um, bottle of pop or 16-ounce, whatever they are, right, you're usually paying a higher price. Whereas if you buy a six pack, the second, third, fourth, and fifth and sixth one are usually priced at a different amount so that the entire bundle is priced less, right? That's an, again, another form of second degree price discrimination, but the buy one, get one half off. That's the one that's the, um, the main classic example of that. And then working our way up the chain, first degree price discrimination is both. So it's when and it's not that common, but it's when you have different customers paying different prices and the number of units that they buy is also different. And so another classic example of third degree price discrimination is if you've got, um, you and I both walk into a, oh boy, I can't draw very well, but um, a car dealership. Are we going to pay the same price for a car? No, 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 we're going to pay dramatically different prices for a car, right? And if we were to buy a second car, which sounds a little ridiculous. But if we we're going to buy a second car, would we get the same discount for the second car? So the, the only reason that I mention that is prior to, to the 2008 recession, um, when the economy was doing really, really well, um, especially the auto industry, they were actually doing this, right? So um, a couple of the dealerships were, were selling an SUV, and then they were giving like a half off on one of small energy efficient um, car nation that you think of in your life. In order to be able to successfully price discrimination, discriminate, there are two attributes that have two factors that have to be present, right? So the first is you have to, from a producer perspective, you have to be able to distinguish customer type, right? So you've got to be able to identify what 
the relevant criteria being discriminated. And we're thinking this primarily of the customer type, but you'd also be able to have to be able to distinguish the first unit versus the second unit versus the third unit if you were doing second degree price discrimination. But it's, it's more natural to think about it in terms of you got to be able to identify customer type. And so again, if we think about that, that military discount for going um, to the movie theaters, right? Um, how do they verify that the person they're selling that ticket to is in the military. Usually they'll ask for some kind of ID or a student discount, right? Usually they ask for a student ID or something like that. And so the um, with the ability to distinguish customer type, um, the producers need to be able to get a credible signal that allows them to distinguish customer type. And so wh what do I mean by that, right? So if you if you show an ID, is that a signal, right? That's clearly a signal to indicate what kind of customer type you are. And is it a credible signal? Is it something that could easily be faked, right? So if you think about somebody getting a, could you uh, make a fake student ID in order to get a discount at a movie theater? Sure. Is it going to be worth it, right? Is the benefits going to be, justify the cost of creating a fake college ID in order to get a discount at a movie theater? Probably not, right? And so you can think about that natural cost barrier um, might make people not want to fake that signal and so that might be um, that might be a way to make that a, a pretty credible signal but hey student IDs expire um, and people keep using them I know I did for way too long but I kept getting the discount right it's a it's a signal that that was that I could easily pretty easily fake in that case the stakes aren't that high but when we start talking about higher stake price discrimination um, then what a signal is and whether or not a signal is credible becomes much more important in order to be able to establish price discrimination by a producer. You got to be able to figure out who's in front of you. Number two, you got to be able to prevent that person from reselling, right? You got to be able to prevent resale. So the classic example that I always give, and I think this is ridiculous, but in, um, in Ada, Ohio, there is a Taco Bell and there is not a student discount. There was, and they took it away. Instead, there's a faculty discount, right? So I can actually go with my faculty ID and I could buy um, $10 of burrito, burritos and I'm going to get, um, I'm going to get $9, I'm gonna only going to have to pay $9 for my $10 worth of burritos. So what could I do with my 10 burritos at a dollar each, right? Or I only had to pay 90 cents each, right? What I could do is I could position myself right outside the Taco Bell on the sidewalk and I could set up a little stand where I try to sell all of those burritos. Right. And I could sell those burritos. I could post a sign that advertised my Taco Bell version of burritos for 95 cents. And again, so I'm undercutting the price of Taco Bell. I can get away with it because I have this customer type that allows me to get some kind of discount. Right. And I buy them for for 90 cents. I sell them for 95. I make a profit and you as a uh, or other passers by I don't know if you'd actually want to buy these right but other passers by who are willing to buy the 95 cent tacos right hey they're also saving 5 cents over the taco bell so this is a two is a win-win situation right if there's an ability to price discriminate then right taco bell or if there is price discrimination, I should say, then some people might want to buy at a low price and then sell to others who don't have access to that low price, allowing both of those participants to be better off than they other would be, otherwise would be, right? And it's undercutting what Taco Bell is trying to do. That process, it's arbitrage, right? Arbitrage, formally a definition, generating profits from the buying and selling of an asset that exploit price difference, right? I buy my tacos for 90 cents. I sell them for 95 cents. That's still cheaper than the dollar that Taco Bell is selling them for. And so me and that consumer end up better off. We're undercutting Taco Bell, right? In order for Taco Bell to effectively price discriminate and maximize their welfare outcomes, they've got to be able to cut this off. They've got to be able to prevent this kind of resale from happening. Sometimes that's easy. Sometimes it's more difficult. Okay, as we finish out this discussion about third degree price discrimination, I want to include a beautiful little equation. So to me, this is one of the most aesthetically pleasing economics equations. And so I'll put the whole thing down there and then we'll, we'll talk about the, the, what it means. Okay, so this is, this is a little bit beyond this class, but I'm going to lay it here for anybody who really likes the, <clears throat> the mathematics of it all. <clears throat> when we have a firm that has any kind of market power, and again, 
<clears throat> not again, but for the first time, <laughs> price discrimination, it only works when we've got some, some market power. So if a firm has some market power, total revenue is price times quantity, but if they have market power, it means that price is not a constant. It means that price is a function of quantity. And so I can rewrite the total revenue equation as um, P of Q, right? Price is a function of quantity times quantity, price times quantity. And really marginal revenue is just a derivative right the derivative of total revenue with respect to q we can take this general form of this total revenue with market power and if you apply the product rule maybe i lost some of you that's okay just jump to the punchline right it's dp dq times q plus p and then if i factor out the p i'd get dp dq q over p plus one algebraically those are equivalent um, and i can identify this little thing dp dq q over p is one over our own price elasticity of demand, right? It's another uh, way to, to write it with calculus. Um, and so really, that's another way to write my marginal revenue equation. And if a firm wants to maximize profit, they should set this marginal revenue equation equal to marginal cost. And if I take that and rearrange it, here's the punchline. Here's the punchline. If a firm is going to price discriminate, this is the price they should charge. Or in general, right, if a firm has some degree of market power, this is the equation that they should use to determine how they price their product. What we've set up to this point, right, is that we've got demand and we've got supply, and usually it's demand and supply coming together that determine the price in the market. Really, that's what's built into this equation. Notice the MC is really, right, related to the, the supply side of the market. The marginal cost curve defines the supply curve for a firm, and so there's my link to supply. And then what is this? ED, we're talking about the own price elasticity of demand, right? And so this term is related to the shape of the demand curve, right? So this, it, why I love this equation is because it really contains two different pieces of information. Information about the supply and information about consumer behavior. And it's really this coming together of producers and their costs uh, and consumers and their behavior that is going to determine what the price in the market should be. That's the key punchline takeaway. As a thought experiment, though, do this, right? And again, I'm deleting all this because it's there as a point of reference, but certainly you never, ever are going to be asked anything like that. But I might ask you something like this. What if we have two groups, EDA and EDB, with two different elasticities? Let's have this first group be 1.5. Oops, not negative, right? I forgot. In this class, we're using positive values. So 1.5. Um, they're elastic. Second group, let's have them be a 3.0. They're also elastic, right? So which of those two groups is more elastic, right? This group is more elastic. Can you put into words what that represents? The other thing we want to add to this story is we've got their elasticities. Now let's assume that the marginal cost is $10. Oops, the marginal cost is $10. And I'm going to assume that both have the same marginal cost. Again, if we think about that movie theater example, you sell a ticket to someone with a military discount or you sell um, a ticket to me who does not have a military discount or any other kind of discount at this point in my life, right? The cost is the same. The difference is our consumer behavior, but fundamentally the cost of producing that good is identical for those different customer types. What's different is their elasticity. So I want you to pause and calculate these two things. Calculate the price for group A using this equation and then calculate the price for group B using this equation and which of those prices are higher and then the follow-up question would be which of these groups represents me a middle-aged person with no discounts whatsoever and which of those groups might represent you as a college student or your grandmother so what we've done up to this point is we've talked about two different market structures, perfectly competitive markets where we have all these firms, and they're all competing against each other and they're all selling identical products. And the only thing that matters to consumers are, are prices. And at the other extreme, we've got a monopolist where we've got just one firm who has all the power in the market and they don't face any competition whatsoever. But think about some of these different market structures. This is uh, rice production. This is a generic pharmaceutical manufacturer. Um, we've got some, the auto industry. We've got a local pizza place, right? Are any of those a perfectly competitive market where the only thing that matters to consumers is price? Probably rice. But these others, right? There's some price differential between these other um, co competitors. And there's not just one competitor, but maybe it's dominated by a small number of competitors, right? And so 
what we want to do is we want to think about a couple of other types of markets that, that are somewhere in between perfectly competitive and a monopoly market. The first one we're going to look at is monopolistic competition. So now notice right away that it's got two different names in it, right? It's got the word competition in it. And so there are going to be aspects of this story that are similar to a perfectly competitive market, but it's also got the word monopolistic in it. It's not a monopoly but it's like a monopoly, right? So this is competition that looks, that has attributes of monopoly markets, right? And so here we go. We've got many buyers and sellers with some but imperfect ability to influence price. And what I mean by that is going back to that GM example, right? If GM were to um, put an additional item on their car, some, some rear facing camera or a special kind of rear, rear facing camera or something like that, would their competition have to sit up and take note or could their competition just ignore them? Right? Might GM be able to charge higher prices for this new uh, attribute that they add to their car? Right? So what we've got is a GM is not a price taker, right? They have some ability to influence the market price, but are they the only ones who determine what the price in the market is? No, they do face other competition, right? That's what we're getting at. Um, with pro uh, the assumption number two, we've got product differentiation, right? If you recall, there are two main uh, components to product differentiation. Number one, consumers have to believe that there's a difference in goods. It doesn't actually have to be there, but consumers perceive that there's a difference between two different goods. And number two, they're willing to put money down on that perceived difference. And so another example of a market that has monopolistically competitive attributes are with laundry detergent, right? Um, and so this is basically just asking, do people have brand loyalty? Do people think that Tide is a better or inferior product compared to his competition? Yeah, right? There's definitely some some belief that some laundry detergents are better than others. And again, that's the first part. Do consumers perceive there's a difference? Yeah, they do. Is that difference real? Uh, yes, they definitely are, right? And so sometimes this product differentiation is about higher quality products. In a perfectly competitive market, everybody's selling the exact same thing. But in a monopolistically competitive market, there is this ability to have this difference in quality or at the minimum, a perception of a difference in quality. And consumers are willing to put money down on that perceived difference. If you go to a grocery store, I'm assuming you've done this before. If you go to a grocery store and you look at the laundry detergents, right? Are they all pro priced identical? No, they're not, right? There's a difference in price, and some people are willing to pay higher money for brand loyalty. That's fundamentally what product differentiation is. The other example that, that I can throw out there is um, I've got running shoes, right? So, or really any kind of athletic shoes. So if, if you've ever done any kind of athletic activity pretty seriously and ran through a couple of pairs of shoes, right? You can think about, is there a difference between the name brand athletic shoes and the generic alternatives, right? I made the mistake once in my life of buying like a really cheap pair of running shoes for like 15 bucks offline. And oh my gosh, did I ever pay the price? That really was a legitimate difference in quality, right? There was absolutely, it met that first criteria of a difference in quality. And there was this difference in price that was reflective of that perceived quality, right? There was absolutely product differentiation. The other example that we, that we usually talk about in class is with drugs, right? Specifically, the, the name brand patent protected drugs. And I often talk about Claritin as a classic example because a lot of people are, are aware of that or know someone who's taken that, right? Claritin D, right? Name brand patent protected drug for a number of years. And then what happened is its patent expired and all these generic competitors started jumping into the market and competing. And so Walmart's got their name brand and Target has their name brand version of Claritin D. And there's all of these generic competition. But, right, and so that's the story of monopoly versus a competitive market, but even to this day, do people still buy Claritin B rather than the target brand generic? They do, right? And is there a money difference between those two products? There is. You've got people who are paying higher price for that name brand of Claritin D. And then I usually turn and ask the pharmacist students in the room, hey, is there a difference between um, uh, an original drug and the generic um, competitors. And usually we say, no, there's no difference, right? But actually, if you ask a pharmacist, there is. It has to do with the uh, range of bioavailability that the FDA says is acceptable. And so they're not exactly the same. Um, there's uh, There can be a difference in inactive ingredients between the two. And so they're similar, right? But um, 
but there really is a difference between them. Um, how significant that difference is in terms of clinical outcomes is a very different question. But what we're focusing on here is not that clinical story, but rather the consumer behavior perspective. Consumers believe there's a difference in Claritin D versus the other, or Tylenol versus the acetaminophen of the, the Meyer or something like that, right? Consumers are totally, some consumers are totally willing to pay extra prices for that perceived uh, difference based on brand name. That's what product differentiation is. Few, if any, barriers to entry exist. So what are we talking about here, right? We're talking about if we've got an existing firm in the market that's making some profitability, that might be a signal for other firms to try to jump into the market. Is there a difficulty in new firms joining the market and trying to compete? No. So again, we think about the laundry detergent, right? What's really stopping you from, <laughs> from trying to start your own laundry detergent company and competing with, with some of these big dogs that are that are fighting out for the market, right? Um, there might be uh, a difficulty in doing it because of an experience curve or something like that, but really, what's stopping you? You could go to a bank, you could try to get some financing, all this kind of stuff, right? There's really not much of a barrier for new competition to try to jump in this market and try to compete against each other. It seems like the big barrier is this product differentiation, but other than that, nah, not really a big significant barrier to entry. And, and then again, we keep with the assumption about a perfectly competitive market. And so then my follow-up question about all this is, all right, so step back and take a big picture look at this. Which of these assumptions are similar to a perfectly competitive market? And which of these assumptions are similar to a monopoly market? And our big takeaway is that <clears throat> in a perfectly competitive market, right, what's the one thing that people care about? Price. The thing that people care about is price. They don't care who they buy it from, right? There's no product differentiation in a perfectly competitive market. In a perfectly competitive market, things from each seller look identical in consumers' eyes. In this market, and so when when consumers only care, view everything as being identical, the only thing that consumers care about is price. But in a monopolistically competitive market, because there are things that, that creep into consumers' eyes other than price, where they think there's a difference between producers, it allows them to compete on what we call non-price factors, right? So this is, again, a fancy word for saying a difference in quality or any of those other things that allow a firm to differentiate brand loyalty, those sorts of things right? We can, we can really quickly put together a graph of what this looks like. And <laughs> I just want to point out, if you step back, does this graph look familiar? It should, right? You've got a U-shaped marginal cost curve, and you've got a demand curve, and you've got a marginal revenue curve that has the same vertical intercept and twice the slope. Doesn't this look almost identical to the monopoly market? We're going to change one small thing about it, right? This isn't a monopoly market, though. It's a monopolistically competitive market. So here's the difference. This demand, it's not the demand for the monopolist's product. It's the demand for the individual differentiated product, right? And so this is the demand for Tide Laundry. This is the demand for Chevy Cars, right? It's the demand for those individual brand loyalty, uh, product differentiated items. It's not the demand for automobiles. It's not the demand for laundry detergent. It's the demand for that specific brand. What producers do when they differentiate their product is they create an individual demand for their differentiated product, but demand is a downward sloping line. Just like we looked at with a monopolist for this demand, if this monopolistically competitive firm raises prices, they're going to lose out on some customers, right? There's going to, they're going to face an inverse relationship between the price of their individual product and the quantity of their individual product. Because of that, the marginal revenue has the same shape as what we talked about with the monopolist, the same vertical intercept and twice the slope. But once we have that established, everything else about this graph is going to look identical to a monopolist. So here we go. Ha, what quantity, number one, most important question, what quantity should a firm produce to maximize profit? What quantity should a firm produce to maximize profit? Hopefully you've got that <clears throat> drilled into your mind by now. Rationally, if they think about that first unit, this is the revenue, this is the cost, this is the gain from that first unit, and the second unit, and the third unit, and the fourth unit, and their profit's going to keep going up until marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. That's the way to answer this question, right? <clears throat> so just like we did with the monopolist, where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, 
That's the quantity that a monopolistically competitive market will produce. And what I want to jump ahead and point out, if we treat the marginal cost as being equal to the supply curve based on the cost structure, where supply and demand intersect with those perfectly competitive markets that we talked about earlier, you know, demand, supply, P star, Q star, that was the quantity of an undifferentiated market. This is the quantity that would be produced if firms were not trying to differentiate their product. If consumers viewed all of the items as being identical, there'd be a higher quantity. Then we can turn to the story of pricing, right? So again, if I take this quantity, just like I did with the monopolist, if I take that quantity up to the original demand curve, and again, this is the demand for the individual product, that is the price that a monopolistically competitive firm will charge for their product, and it's higher than the prices when there is not product differentiation, right? So again, we think about all these generic manufacturers of laundry detergent, they're all basically selling at the same price, but Tide is sold at a higher price right? That higher price, consumers believe it's a reflection of some underlying quality. There's some product differentiation, so consumers are willing to pay a higher price. That's the two prices that we're seeing right now. The undifferentiated product, where there's just competition and the only thing that people care about is price, are prices. That's what P-Star represents. When a firm differentiates their product, this is the price that they charge. There's a little bit of a gain for these producers by differentiating their product. But notice, if we think about some of the welfare outcomes, the main one, right, you, this looks identical to the monopoly, a broken record here, right? But the same thing in terms of consumers being worse off when there's differentiated products, producers ambiguous, but probably better off. But the main one as an economist that I care about from an allocative perspective is when firms differentiate their product, when firms spend time convincing consumers that what they're selling is special and unique and different from everyone else, and they differentiate their product, they create a deadweight loss, right? This deadweight loss is created when firms differentiate their product. And again, we think about Adam Smith. He said competition, we'll love it, right? All this competition, these competitive forces will lead us to the best places. But monopolistically competitive markets are when people wouldn't try to establish brand loyalty or when they allow for a difference in quality or those kinds of things. And that influence on consumer behavior introduces an inefficiency into the market. <clears throat> we've got this little relationship here. Firms maximize profit where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, but in a perfectly competitive market, in the long run, <clears throat> prices, because of the, the idea about entry and exit into the market, prices are going to be driven down to the, the minimum of the average total cost curve, which is equal to marginal revenue equals marginal cost. This is the set of identities that we have in the long run for a perfectly competitive market. I want to point out real quick what the monopolistically competitive market looks like. This guy. Firms in a monopolistically competitive market still want to maximize profit, so marginal revenue is still equal to marginal cost. In the long run, competition is still going to uh, enter into this market, right? So if this, I don't want to make this graph any messier than what it is, but if I added an average total cost curve on here, if there's some profitability in this market, there's going to be incentive for people to jump in off the sidelines. So you can think about what's going to happen to the demand for Tide when more people start jumping into the laundry detergent business. That demand for their individual product is going to go down, right? Just like what we had before, new entrants into the market are going to cut into existing profitability. And so in the long run, prices are going to be down to the equal to average total cost so that there's zero economic long-term profits. But the difference is, in a monopolistically competitive market, these two values, they're not equal to each other. In a perfectly competitive market, they all converge to the same value. But in a monopolistically competitive market, we end up with zero long-run profits, but a level of price that's above the cost of production. And again, uh, that kind of helps explain where this inefficiency comes from. This little piece on the side, don't worry about it too much. I want the main focus for you all um, to be on this graph. And the last thing that we want to say about this is, how does a firm differentiate their product? And so I'm an economist, and I'm a jaded economist, so I think of marketing as this is all that marketing people do. It's totally wrong, and it's a biased opinion, and I know that, and I usually make a joke out of it, right? But when I think about what's the point of marketing, when people study marketing and then they go out into an industry and they do marketing, there's actually a bunch of different things they do, right? There's the four Ps. But to me as an economist, this is where the story of marketing fits neatly into my world of economics. 
marketing is what differentiates a product. That's not true, right? There's, <laughs> that's not the only thing that differentiates a product. There can also be a quality component. But we can think about rationally, when should a firm do marketing? Rationally, when should a firm do, um, do marketing? What are the benefits? Again, when we look at the benefits of marketing, the benefits of differentiating your product is how much you can charge higher prices. But how much does Nike spend on advertising every year, right? There are significant costs associated with trying to differentiate your product. And so it's always a question, right, for your market. Do the benefits that are going to be generated by differentiating your product justify the increased cost that you have to spend in order to differentiate your product? When we think about um, uh, producers producing a higher quality item, right? It, it usually costs more money to produce a higher quality item. Is it going to be worth it? Or do you want to go with a lower quality item that might save consumers some money? Is that a smarter way to do it? So again, right? We're just adding this, this layer of la rationality to the story of marketing, but this is where marketing fits into the economics story. The other type of market structure that we want to talk about real quick is an oligopoly. So I'm going to talk about an oligopoly, but in fact, there are a number of different models of oligopoly out there. One of them that we're going to look at has these four assumptions. Few sellers. We don't have that many people. We've got a bunch of buyers. No product differentiation. So we're going back to our assumption about homogenous product. Everybody's selling the same thing, but the key is there's not that many of them. So maybe they might have an incentive to try to work together instead of competing against each other, right? If you look around the room and you've only got three or four competitors, you can see what each other's doing. Do you really want to compete with each other? Or maybe would it make sense for you strategically to act together as a single unit? Um, that's going to be the, the concern with oligopolies. Oligopolies, because there's a small number, they're going to be in a better economic position, and so there's got to be something that prevents new firms from joining the market, right? There's got to be barriers to entry that prevent new firms from joining the market. And let's go ahead and keep that assumption about perfect information. This is the story of collusion and cartel. Again, collusion um, in this context is the joint pricing or production decision. Collusion is illegal. You shouldn't be doing collusion, right? And we've got some laws um, on the books, and we've got some judicial rulings in the U.S. that uh, that <clears throat> that outlaw this kind of behavior, um, that make it illegal. Because, right, fundamentally, in a, in a lot of the founding documents of this country, right, we've got this this ethos of of introducing a competitive spirit, right? It's clearly not the main focus of of the founding of the country, but definitely um, the idea of a competitive spirit. Uh, driving public policy was there at the beginning, and then it's been held up through a number of decades of judicial um, uh, judicial findings, right? So we've got this, this we like competition because of all the things that it does in terms of increasing welfare. Collusion is a verb. It's the joint pricing or production decisions. Cartel is the name, it's a noun, of the group that colludes, right? So the group that colludes is the cartel, and the collusion that they do um, that's their joint pricing or product uh, pricing decision, right? So we can think about one of the most famous cartels is OPEC. Um, if you go real quick, you can Google OPEC's website. They have a whole website, right? It's the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, right? And so it's it's not considered illegal because of that international component to it, right? But you've basically got, uh, like its name implies, a whole bunch of countries. They export a whole lot of petroleum. And so um, they get together periodically, and they think about making joint pricing or product or uh, production decision. And so part of, if you go and look at some of the literature uh, or what OPEC says about itself, is they say, right, so if we look at petroleum prices, and if we look at petroleum prices through time, that if we just left it, or their argument is that if they just left it up to the market, you would have huge fluctuations in the price of petroleum. But they argue that one of the things that they do is they get together and they make joint production and pricing decisions so that they can, in essence, reduce the uncertainty in petroleum prices. And so if you're in the U.S. and you're running a business and you're trying to make some kind of projection of the next three to five years budget, energy costs might be a big significant portion of a new project. If you're thinking about whether or not to take on that new project, the more certainty you have, the better, right? And so that's the benefit that OPEC argues that it does, that they are getting together not to enrich themselves, but rather to reduce the uncertainty to help with long-term business planning.
right? It might just be happen that they enrich themselves as well. But they, they also say that they do this social benefit of reducing the uncertainty in petroleum markets. We mentioned cartels and collusion of firms working together, but notice I've got a little payoff matrix of two countries who um, are in OPEC or were in OPEC. I had to go back and double check to make sure that these countries were, were still in there. My list, I put it together a, a number of years ago, and, and occasionally um, the members um, change. Um, people come, people go, not that common, but it, it does happen sometimes. So you can think about, right, all of these countries get together and they make joint production and pricing decisions periodically, right? And then what happens is everybody goes home and decides how much to produce. And so we can think about um, if, if, if the outcomes in this payoff matrix represent the profit that they earn. This is not at all representative of actual numbers, but it highlights the potential conceptual problem that OPEC might face. So Algeria, Iran, if they were trying to get together and decide as a group how much should they produce, they could either decide to produce a high quantity where they're all competing against each other, or they could all try to restrict their output act like a monopolist and get in a better position, right? If you look at the level of profitability, if you total those up, where is the total profits the highest? Total profits are the highest up here where both countries are colluding, right? Colluding means that you are trying to act like a monopolist and monopolists hold back their output. So if both of them are colluding, that's where they're both, where they're going to have the, the highest combined profitability. But notice what happens to Algeria, right? And so that might be what's best for the group, but individually, does Algeria really want to stick with this decision that they made a few weeks ago at the OPEC meeting? Or might they want to change their decision and cheat on the agreement and produce a little bit more, right? Think about this. If Iran sticks with the decision of colluding, Algeria, would they really want to stick with this decision of producing low quantity and colluding? Or might they want to cheat on the agreement? They would, right? They have an economic incentive to cheat on the agreement, but go the other direction, right? If Algeria sticks with their decision to collude, does Iran really want to stick with uh, low quantity, or could they cheat on the agreement and be a little better? Yep. This is the problem with OPEC, right? Is they make this joint production decision, but then everyone goes home, and everyone has an individual incentive to cheat on the agreement. But when everyone cheats, and so you can take this one step further. If um, Iran, if Algeria was to to cheat on the agreement, would Iran really want to stick with the low quantity? So we're saying if Algeria sticks or cheats on the agreement, does Iran want to stick with what they said, or might they want to go ahead and s and continue cheating as well, or switch to cheating, I should say? And then if let's go the other direction, if Iran uh, sticks with the decision of low quantity, or sorry, if Iran is cheating on their agreement, will Algeria want to stick with their decision of low? Nope, they'd be better off by switching. So we've got both of these countries face a dominant strategy to cheat on the agreement. This idea about working together as a group to do what's best for the group, yeah, that's best for the group, but it's not best for them individually. And so they have an incentive to cheat on the agreement. And so maybe, maybe, maybe um, the the collusion in OPEC might not be as strong as what it otherwise would. And there's some data to suggest that this happens fairly, fairly frequently, that these countries get together, they make some production decisions, they make a, a decision, and then everybody goes home and cheats a little bit on the agreement. It's a little bit more of an enforceable agreement when it is repeatable, and OPEC has been around um, for a number of decades, and so that that r repeatedness of the game helps us get closer to the to the collusion. But still, um, we we it doesn't seem from the data that they they ever hit their 100% perfect collusion. The role that OPEC's played in the last few decades um, has changed. They used to control a much much larger proportion of the petroleum market, and so that also has some implications that they have to compete against um, more people. But that's the end of what we want to say with that. Um, the very last topic we want to look at is market concentration. Again, we said we th think about this as a spectrum where at one end we have a perfectly competitive market and at the other end we have a monopolist. Somewhere, most of the time, most industries are not going to be a perfectly competitive market where sellers are producing identical items. And most of the time, we don't have a monopolist, but we have somewhere in between. And so we need to ask, how could we try to measure how far in between a perfectly competitive and a monopoly market we are? We have two main tools that we use for that. We've got um, the four-firm concentration ratio, the C4. 
and we've got the herfindahl hirschman index, or more commonly, the, the Herfindahl or the HHI, right? So the C4, um, I often don't like how mathematically this, this little notation came out, so to make sure it's totally clear what that's saying is, the C4 is S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus S4 divided by ST, where SI is equal to the sales of the ith largest firm. So SI is the sale of the number one firm in the industry. S2 is the sales of the number two firm in the industry, and so on and so on and so on. And ST are the total sales in the industry. So real quick, this should be pretty easy, but if I told you that an industry has a C4 of 0.63, could you explain what that value represents? <clears throat> the other thing that we can do is we can define WI. So WI is just SI over ST. So I can rewrite this C4 equation as S1 over ST plus S2 over ST plus S3 over ST plus S4 over ST. And I can rewrite that as WI or W1 plus W2 plus W3 plus W4. And what's WI? It's the market share, right? So W1 is the market share of the top firm in the market. Firm uh, W2, market share of the number two firm in the market. So really, what's the C4? It's the market share of the top four firms in the market. Real quick, mathematically, can you calculate what the market shares are in this table? Right? Verify you got the same numbers I did, right? For this this set of data that we're looking at that we're considering, right? This hypothetical example, firm one's market share, 0 0.40, right? They have 40% is their market share of the top firm in the market. The C4 is simply looking at the top four firms in the market. What's their market share? So we've got 40 plus 20 plus 16 plus um, 12 should be a C4 of 0.88, right? And that's saying that 88% of the market is in these top four firms. These top four firms in the market have 80% of the market share. Um, there's a couple of different ways that you can um, use words to explain what's going on here. The only word that I'm going to um, encourage you not to use is the word control, right? So that is a little bit, um, it implies something <laughs> that may not necessarily be there. And so you can say they have market share or uh, their market share is, but I don't think you want to say controls the market because I think that's a little bit... Um, um, pejorative. It has a little bit of a connotation there that might not necessarily <clears throat> fit. Okay, this is the C4 of these top four firms in the market. I want to point out one criticism of the C4 real quick. I'm going to change two values. What if firm one goes up to 1200 and firm two drops down to 300? Can you recalculate what the value of C4 is? Right, what you should have found is that when those sales values change, market shares of the top two firms have changed, but the C4 didn't change, right? And conceptually, what's happened here? The biggest firm in the market got even bigger. When we think about this spectrum of competition, if we have a situation where the biggest firm in the market gets even bigger, are we moving to the competitive story or more to the monopoly? right? When the biggest firm gets even better, that's an increase in the concentration of power in that one firm. That sounds more and more like a monopoly, right? To think about this spectrum, we can also think about what are the endpoint values. If we did have a monopoly, what value of C4 would it take, right? Think about this real quick. If we have a monopoly, the C4 is the market share of the top four firms. If we've got a monopoly, there's only one firm. What's that monopolist market share? One. The other thing that I want to consider, though, is what if instead of having a monopoly, what if instead we have what's called a duopoly? A duopoly, like its name implies, is when um, we have two firms in a market. If we only had two firms in a market, can you calculate what the C4 is? It doesn't matter what their individual market share is. The C4 is the market share of the top four firms. If there's only two of them, their C4 is also going to be 1.0. My goodness, right? Going from one firm to two firms, that sounds like we're moving towards a more competitive environment, but the C4 wouldn't react to that change, right? Nah, that's, a, that's some of the issues with the C4 is it's not necessarily a good, um, a sensitive at, at, at making changes. It's got a really nice explanation. It's very easy to communicate to your boss or your client what's going on with this metric, but it's going to miss some things. It's not, not as sensitive of a measure as, as, um, 
as maybe we'd like sometimes. Other thought experiment. Think about where would a perfectly competitive C4 be, right? If it, we've got a perfectly competitive environment, we've got all these different firms, they're all competing with each other, everybody's small, nobody has a lot of power, their market share of the top four firms, hey, the top four is still going to be really small, and so C4 at its lower end could be a zero. So the C4 is somewhere between zero and one, and the value is telling us how far along this spectrum it is, though it's not always sensitive to changes, and it's not always a, a perfect way to measure things. I say that, but in actuality, right, it's the, the, there's an area of the U.S. government, I'm pretty sure it's the Census Bureau who does this, that looks, um, it takes a census of different industries periodically, and they don't just estimate the C4, but they do a, a industry report that, that produces the, the C4, the C8, the C16, the C32, and the C64, um, right, and so we've got that, that mathematical structure to it. But what are we looking at, right? If we look at the C16, it's the market share of the top 16 firms in a market. Okay, so right, this might be a way, at reporting all of these statistics might be a way to capture some of that, some of that changes that, that just the C4 alone in isolation might not. A more complicated metric, but a more sensitive metric is this Herfindahl. So what do we got? I want to talk through that notation of that real quick. The Herfindahl Hirschman index, the HHI, what is it? It's 10,000 times the sum going up to T. So we're looking at the sum of every single firm of what? Of their WI squared. So what are we doing? We're looking at the market share of each firm, squaring it, and adding up that value for every single firm in the market and then multiplying that number by 10,000. So I'm going to go back to my original values of 1,000. That's my market share of 0 0.40 and 0 0.20. And actually, I'm going to bring up Excel and carry it out there. <clears throat> okay, so I just moved the data over to Excel. I've got, notice the equation there. I've got my, I'm just summing up the total sales of 2,500. And we needed the market share, right? We, we did it in our heads the other day, but if we were trying to do this formally, right, I've got the sales of the top firm divided by the total sales in the market, and then to lock that value in. So it's telling me the market share. Yep, and if I copy this down the whole list, it should give us the numbers that we did in our head half a second ago. Perfect, right? And again, um, if I look at one, two, three, four, notice down below, I've got the sum of the market share of the top four firms. Yeah, that's the C4, perfect, right? To get the HHI, what I need to do is I need to make the market share squared, right? This is market share, and this is market share squared. So I'm going to take the value of the market share and square it, right? And then when I do that, copy it down the list. Remember for the C4, we're only looking at the top four firms, but for this HHI, we add up all of the squared market shares and we get a number. I'm missing one thing about this. We take the sum of the squared market shares and multiply it by 10,000. So the HHI for that data is 2,480. What does that mean, right? That's a ridiculous number. It's an index, so it doesn't tell you a whole lot, right? Remember um, that it's an index, so the value itself isn't very useful. We could do two things with it. Number one, we can look through time to compare whether a market is becoming more concentrated or less concentrated, or we can look across industries and say that this industry is more concentrated than another. But fundamentally, the value itself doesn't tell us anything, right? So we talked about the C4. Let's consider um, the extremes of the HHI, right? So if we calculated the HHI for the monopolist, right? Let's see, their market share is one, right? 100% which I write as 1, and if I square 1, I get 1, and it's the whole list, so 1 times 10,000. If I have a monopolist, the HHI is 10,000. That's the upper bound of what the HHI could be. But real quick, think about this. If you had a duopoly where the first market share was 0.5, and the second market share was 0.5. So I go from a monopolist to two firms in the market who evenly split the market. Do this on your own. Calculate what is the HHI for that kind of duopoly, 
right? And what you find by this calculation is, whereas the C4 didn't move at all when we went from a monopoly, monopoly to a duopoly, the HHI dramatically shifts, um, right? And so it's an index. It tells you how far along the spectrum it is, and it's much, much, much better and more sensitive um, at those kinds of small changes. At the low end, what could the HHI have? If we had a perfectly competitive market, so we have no concentration of power, right? No concentration of power. Everybody's small and insignificant. No one has, no one producer has any ability to influence market price. No concentration of power. Market shares are going to be these really, really, really small numbers. And when I square a really small number, I get an amazingly small number. And if I add a whole bunch of them up, they don't amount to a hill of beans. So, yep, the low end of the HHI, it goes from a value of zero all the way up to 10,000. The other thing that I wanted to do real quickly is, remember, we were considering what if the top firm grew at the expense of the number two firm. So basically, if the see or if the market became more concentrated if the big dog in the firm got even big in the market got even bigger than everyone else it sounds like we should be moving towards a more concentrated market we can hop over to an excel and this is why i wanted to do an excel because i can really easily change these things because the formulas right if i just increase the sales of the top at the expense of number two again notice the sale or the market share of the top four firms the c4 not going to respond but Notice what happened to the HHI. It did respond. It did get better. The, the HHI is just a more sensitive measure to these distributional changes that the C4 may not be, be picking up on.